Welcome. My name is Naomi Starkman, and I'm the founder and editor-in-chief at Civil Eats, a daily news source about the American food system. I'm really honored today to be moderating this panel, Improving Farm Animal Welfare, in which we hope to examine poor production practices and different ways to bring about higher welfare livestock standards in California and across the nation. This panel is the third in a series of events for Nyman Ranch's 22nd annual Hog Farmer Appreciation Celebration. The series features luminaries like Michael Pollan, Dr. Temple Graydon, as well as virtual farm tours, chef and farmer panels, and much more, all to celebrate their network of independent family farmers and sustainable agriculture. You can visit Nyman Ranch HFAD.com for more information. We are gonna encourage you to leave questions in the chat and we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this panel for Q&A. I'd like to next introduce today's panelists. Celise Christie is the next generation coordinator at Practical Farmers of Iowa. Celise joined Practical Farmers of Iowa in June, 2018 as swine and poultry coordinator and took over the next gen coordinator role in March, 2020. Her work focuses on working with aspiring farmers through the Labor for Learning program, Find a Farmer site, and Latino Outreach Project. Maisie Gansler is the Chief Strategy and Brand Officer at Bon Appetit Management Company. She joined BAMCO in 94 and has been instrumental in shaping its overall strategic direction. She oversees Bon Appetit strategic initiatives, culinary development, purchasing, marketing, communications, and web projects, and has helped to create and launch many of Bon Appetit's many progressive initiatives, among them reducing antibiotics use in poultry in 2002, uh, switching to cage-free shell eggs in 2005, and phasing out gestation crates for pork in 2012. More recently, she has been focusing on antibiotics in agriculture and aquaculture and plant forward innovation. Rachel Dreskin is the U.S. Executive Director at Compassion and World Farming. She has worked extensively with Fortune 500 companies to incorporate and strengthen animal welfare with corporate sustainability programs. She is leading Compassion USA's growing role in forging a more humane and sustainable food and farming system through measurable farmed animal welfare improvements and protein diversification. And John Gilbert, who is a Nyman Ranch farmer, John believes that farming has a continued prominent role to play in American daily life in terms of the economic well-being and health for both the land and its people. And he has been supplying pigs to Nyman Ranch for the last 20 years, was awarded the organization's Farmer of the Year in 2017, and along with his wife, Beverly, his son, John C., and his son's wife, Sarah, he operates the 480-acre Gibraltar Farms where they raise antibiotic-free, pasture fair of pigs, milk brown Swiss dairy cattle, and grow an array of crops and forage in Iowa. So welcome to all of you. It's really wonderful to be here with you, and I've really enjoyed getting to know more about each of your work. Um, I want to start this conversation first by just reading um, a statement from Nyman Ranch in which they affirm compliance with California's Proposition 12. And we'll talk a little bit about what Proposition 12 is and what it means, not only for California, but for the nation. But I just wanna read this today and Nyman Ranch is going to be issuing this so people have access to the actual uh, content text that I'm about to read. This is from uh, Chris Olivier, Oliviero, Nyman Ranch's general manager. Regarding um, California Proposition 12, the Farm Animal Confinement Initiative. Nyman Ranch is fully compliant with California's Prop 12, the Farm Animal Confinement Initiative, and Massachusetts Question 3, the Act to Prevent Cruelty to Farm Animals to Ban the Sale of Meat from Pigs Using Gestation Crates. Nyman Ranch goes even further with all farm third party certified by Humane Farm Animal Care, otherwise known as Certi Certified Humane and all animals raised outdoors or in deeply bedded pens with a minimum of 150% more space per sow than the current industry standard. Since the company's founding in 1979, Nyman Ranch has set the gold standard for animal welfare, far exceeding all legislative guidelines and recommendations, and has worked with the Animal Welfare Institute starting in 1998 to create the first US 
humane care guidance for pigs. In addition, Dr. Temple Graydon, the renowned animal welfare expert, helped Nyman Ranch write all of our beef, pork, and lamb protocols and continues to review them an annually. So with that, um, I wanna turn this conversation over to start with um, Rachel. And um, Rachel, in your work, I, I know you have been doing quite a bit of policy change and working with large producers to improve practices. And you know, California Proposition 12 implementation is right around the corner. And as we'll discuss, this is going to require that all pork raised and sold in California to come from farms that do not use gestation crates for their sows. Um, we know that nationwide hog produ production is around a $20 billion business and employs around 60,000 farmers. Um, the National Pork Producers Council says that fewer than 1% of those farmers have confinement facilities that will meet Prop 12 standards. So let's talk a little bit about what Prop 12 means, what does it look like for compliance in the pork sector, um, and whether other states are following this trend. Thank you, Naomi. <clears throat> it is such a pleasure to be here today. I also want to extend my thanks to the NIMIM team for inviting me to be a part of this very important discussion uh, centered around Prop 12 and the compliance around that specific to uh, pigs and gestation crates. I also want to take a moment to just note the significance of the moment in right now and this tipping point that we have arrived at um, with, our, with our food system. And there is, um, we are at the position now where Prop 12 was introduced and it passed uh, because of a lot of things that have been going on historically um, with our food system, with calls to reform our food system. And one of the most important parts of that is there is this overwhelming call for transparency now and reform, reform of our food system. And this call for improved animal welfare has never been stronger. And uh, I want to note that this is because of the convergence of a few different things that have been, that have been going on um, for quite some time now. And we are, have been able to arrive at this point because one, I want to note um, consumer demand has allowed us to, to get here. Uh, consumers are consistently expressing that animal welfare is one of the top causes that they care about. And people want to know where their food comes from. They want to know how animals are raised and they have expectations uh, for companies and for policymakers to get closer to aligning with those expectations, which has set the stage for us to get to Prop 12. That's also set the stage for corporations uh, to step up and play a really vital role in reforming our food system and treating animals better as, as well. Um, for thinking food companies like Bon Appetit Management Company and my um, fellow panelist Maisie uh, have been so, so critical in leading the way for, the, for these efforts. Um, some of which uh, Naomi, you have uh, already mentioned with uh, Maisie's intro, um, but it's not just, I wanna call it, it's not just Bon Appetit Management Companies of the world, it's also um, McDonald's who has committed to phasing out gestation crates, Kroger has made commitments uh, and many, many other companies have made commitments as well. And that brings me to the legislative piece as well, which is supporting and complementing this, this shift. And in 2018, uh, Prop 12 passed in California, uh, which uh, Naomi uh, briefly uh, described, but uh, many of us are probably familiar with, but Prop 12 made the sale of pork coming from mother pigs that are housed in gestation crates illegal. And this is in addition to um, the sale of eggs from caged uh, laying hens and veal from, uh, from baby cows housed in cages illegal as well. Now I wanna call out the significance of Prop 12 though, because it not only bans the production but distress, it also bans the sale of fresh pork coming from, um, from mother hens that are part of uh, gestation crate system as well. And also want to highlight that California is the fifth largest economy in the world. So starting January 1st of 2022, fresh pork in California that is to be sold must be from gestation crate free systems where the breeding pigs have a minimum of 24 square feet of usable floor space per pig. And also want to note this is preceded, which is uh, also noted in the uh, announcement that uh, Naomi read uh, from Nyman, 
uh, but this is preceded by question three in, in Massachusetts um, that had similar uh, legislation introduced and passed in 2016, as, long as, uh, as well as eight other states that also have banned the production of um, pigs from gestation crates as well. And I want to note now around the, the implementation of this and what this means and touch on that. And this all sounds, I think, really good that we're heading in the right direction. But I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of challenges uh, that also go along with these supply chain shifts. And especially for, for companies, they need all the information in order to be able to, to make, these, uh, to make these, these changes. And it's also essential for us to identify challenges uh, along the way. And Nyman, as Naomi shared, is already compliant um, with, uh, with Prop 12, which is excellent. Um, but there, as you said, that makes, Nyman makes up a small proportion of the overall supply here. And there are a lot of producers that are not compliant. Um, and the significance of Nyman coming out and saying, yes, we are compliant, we have been compliant, and putting that very transparently on their website is really, really critical to us being able to responsibly make this, make this shift. So for the other producers out there that have not yet uh, made uh, uh, announcements around their intentions around this, um, we need to know, you know, are you aiming to get there? Uh, are you working towards that? What is the date? Um, also importantly, what does gestation crate free mean to you? How are you defining that as a company? There are a lot of different interpretations uh, of that. Uh, there are some like Nyman that never keep uh, the sows in gestation crates for any significant period of time. Um, there are others that are saying gestation crate free or that group housing is where the sows are um, kept in gestation crates for up to six weeks um, after they are inseminated, which is not in alignment with, with what I think consumers would expect when they hear uh, gestation crate, gestation crate free. Um, and then also for the purchasers, transparency is also critical um, for to let every all the stakeholder groups know how are you doing? Are you on track? Are you running into obstacles? And if you are, let's work through that now before we get to December 1st, 2021. Let's identify those and um, make sure that we are in a good position and that all groups that need to be aligned around the implementation of this have the opportunity to, to work through that. Now, there are still some that are signaling, still some producers are signaling they are not moving um, in this direction. And they're digging in he their heels and resisting change, um, which always happens no matter what the supply chain shift we are talking about. Uh, but I do want to note the case for resisting this change is, is not strong in my mind uh, because of the reasons that I outlined, uh, because of consumer demands for transparency and their expectations, because of the corporate commitments and now the legal requirements, the indication that we are moving away from the confinement of sows where the sows can't even stand up and, and turn around, it's clear. So will we go back to treating animals like commodities? I can't think of anything that really indicates that we'll go back. Uh, that we'll go back to that. We have we have moved on uh, as as a society and need to band together to to make that happen. So then, what will happen to those that are not adapting to this? Uh, my feeling is that those uh, that are not following in the path that uh, Nyman has has paved are going to become less and less relevant as time goes on. Um, not just for animal welfare concerns, but also for um, environmental concerns. Uh, factory farming is an unsustainable model for us to continue with. Um, it's interesting that uh, I was just refreshing myself but back in 2012, McDonald's actually said that gestation crates were an unsustainable form of production um, for, for pigs. So that's been uh, signaled for, for quite some time now. But then that also leads to the, the question, um, if some producers are not coming on board with this, are we going to require less protein? And uh, as the population continues to climb, I think the answer to that is likely not. But then the big question is, well, does protein have to come from animals or can it also come from, from plants? Uh, so uh, Naomi mentioned the bio that in Compassion, we advocate um, not only for the improved welfare uh, of, of animals, but also for the reduced 
production and consumption of animal products as well. Um, and any of the remaining animals to come from, a higher, from higher welfare regenerative systems. So with the combination of the consumer demands, the corporate commitments, the legislative change, confinement will become less and less relevant and couple that with the rise in plant-based proteins, which continues to grow. Um, so in the last Tyson's earning call, they identified that their plant-based proteins is a um, uh, huge opportunity for growth within their protein portfolio. Those plant-based proteins are going to provide a, another way to meet consumer expectations, um, to be able to help meet the legislative uh, deadlines, the corporate commitments, and also address many of the sustainability and environmental impacts as well um, that I think will eventually displace that remaining uh, part of the market that does not evolve into, into higher welfare production. And I'll leave with that for the moment. That's really helpful as a good overview. And I'm sure we'll come back to some questions. And I want to also talk with you and John together because you guys um, I can talk about what, how what um, John is doing, what Nyman Ranch is doing is different than conventional ag, um, conventional hog farmers as well. So thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I want to next turn to Maisie Agansler. Um, Maisie, you know, Bon Appetit has been at the forefront of progressive animal welfare policies for as long as I've been familiar with your work. And I know you in, in particular have been leading a lot of the initiatives in that regard. And I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, and hope that you can share for those listening and watching about how Bon Appetit has prioritized leading in this space. Um, and you know, what, what the challenges have been for you, but also where you see some of the opportunities at this particular moment. Thanks, Naomi, and thanks, Rachel, for all that great information setting the table. I want to build on a number of the points that you made in relation to the challenges, but start with the beginning of our journey on this path towards higher welfare for farm animals. It started for Bon Appetit really in 2005 with a question from one college student on one campus in one cafe, and that question was about cage-free eggs at the time. And honestly, I'd never heard the term cage-free eggs, um, nor had the general manager who received this question. And we wound up partnering with the Humane Society of the United States and became the first company to implement a cage-free egg policy and also committed to humane farm animal care certification as Nyman has with their pork. Um, they made that change several years ago as well. And I always like to start with that because as Rachel pointed out, consumers play a large role in this. And it was really one person, one young person, asking a question of what I'm sure seemed to be a huge company to him. Um, that young person, just by chance, not by chance actually, um, in a very interesting turn, name was David Benzaquin, who went on to found a number of plant-based uh, I see Rachel recognizing the name, um, a number of plant-based alternative protein companies and done really great work in this space. And so um, Belize is gonna talk about the power of young people and I wanna underscore that, that those young people with fresh ideas can push big companies to make change. And I wouldn't even say for us, it was the pushing, it was just the raising of the awareness. As I said, we hadn't heard the term. And I think that terms are really important. Rachel touched on the fact that there's been some confusion about what gestation crate free means. And that's something that I'm really excited about Prop 12 clearing up. When we started down our path towards what we thought was gestation crate free, we met with a very large supplier and they made a commitment to going gestation crate free for us. One of the largest suppliers in the world and there's something to be celebrated about the largest supplier in the world making changes because it, it impacts so many animals. As we proceeded down that path, it became clear as mud what they were actually doing. And as we probed and probed and probed, because very different from Nyman who has opened up their farm gates to me several times, has welcomed me onto their property. And I, I don't say that lightly because bringing people onto an animal operation is a decision that you have to make. I'm sure John understands that more deeply than, 
than most of us, but especially in operation that, that doesn't use antibiotics, they have to be very clear about biosafety and biosecurity. With that, Nyman has still been incredibly transparent. This other large supplier, I would say, would have been the opposite. But when we did dig and dig and dig through some very uncomfortable conversations, discovered that their definition of gestation crate free, or as they reframed it during that process, group housed, was that the sows were in crates up until the confirmation of pregnancy. In that case, it was about on average 28 days. A sow is pregnant for three months, three weeks, and three days. So let's call that four months that the sows were spending a full month of that time still in gestation crates. How can you call that gestation crate free? After some very heated conversations, we left that supplier and transitioned to a supplier who does a much better job. This supplier still crates the sows though for artificial insemination. So those sows are created for, on average, seven days of that four-month period. Nyman does something very different. They don't create the sows at all. And John can be specific on this, but I believe um, use a combination of artificial and natural insemination, depending on the operation. Um, but uh, thus eliminating the need for that even week-long period of, of being created. So as Prop 12 comes into effect and has a very clear definition of up to six hours under veterinarian's care. So if a vet needs to actually administer some sort of, of treatment to a sow, it can be created for up to six hours. That's very different than even our current supplier, who I'm very proud of at one week, or the more conventional suppliers that are at a month. Prop 12 is, is a huge shift in that. And in general, I'm not somebody who looks to government action. I believe that that our markets can do a lot, that a company like Bon Appetit partnered with a progressive supplier can make change faster than government can make change. But in this case, there's been so much hogwashing um, or whatever you wanna call uh, being not transparent and, and um, I'm sure, Naomi, you can tell many, many horrible stories about people being sued for taking pictures in farms and, and the, the way that the press has been kept out of large scale animal farming. Um, but having something like Prop 12 really makes the, the playing field clear and even. Now, as Rachel said, right now, many suppliers are saying they're not gonna comply and then they're going to pull out of California. Rachel also pointed out that, Cal or maybe it was, was Naomi, that California is the fifth largest economy in the world. I don't think that when, when push comes to shove that these suppliers are gonna give up that market and not sell any pork in California. I think they're gonna have to make a change. They have been very resistant and at the same time, we're also seeing things like this huge investment from traditional protein companies into all protein. So we know that there's someone at those companies that sees the future and hopefully their voices will be magnified. Consumers can help in that magnification. But I don't wanna pretend that this is easy. It's very hard from a practical standpoint. We are not dealing with widgets we are dealing with live animals. And there are several things about that that make this more complex, just from a logistic standpoint. Pigs don't grow in the same proportion of cuts as we as consumers eat. We eat a lot more bacon than there is on the average pig. <laughs> um, so as we look at scaling up more humane systems, we have to look at also eating the whole animal. And that's a hard thing to do. And it's happening right now at a time with coronavirus that we are at historical lows in our demand. So Bon Appetit's purchasing power right now has never been lower than it, than it is today. And that makes it harder for us to balance that pig 
it makes it harder to control distribution and it makes it harder to be a good customer. And when we work with a producer who's making change, we want to be a good customer. Um, I think that I will leave it at that point and uh, let you come back to me with questions after everybody goes. Okay, that's really very helpful and really uh, explains not only your position at BAMCO, but also what you're seeing in the marketplace and really builds on what Rachel shared. Um, thank you, Maisie, for that. And I will come back to you. Um, so I wanna go to Celise. Um, Celise, I would love for you to talk a little bit about you know, your experience at Practical Farmers. Um, you know, Practical Farmers of Iowa, for those who are not familiar with the organization, you guys have been working for years directly with farmers to create a food and farming system that's resilient and sustainable, but most importantly, profitable. And um, I want you to talk a little bit about how you're helping your farmers adopt increased animal welfare practices, but also speak to the point that Maisie raised and Rachel addressed about this new generation of farmers and a new kind of attitude towards animal welfare that you're seeing in your farm, farmer uh, community. Yes, thank you, Rachel and Maisie. And thank you for that question, uh, Naomi. Um, I guess just to kind of highlight a little bit along what you were saying in introducing PFI, um, like our mission, is to equip uh, farmers to build resilient farms and communities. And a part of, of how we build that resiliency is essentially creating this network, this farmer to farmer network, um, and essentially creating a community of where farmers can essentially learn from one another. Um, you know, we believe in, you know, uplifting and advocating for our farmers and basically having them be the change agents that, you know, they want to see within their landscape. Um, and make those changes within the landscape that they want to see on their farms. And then, you know, then how can we create platforms or areas of connection to where a farmer can connect with their neighbor or their community and then also showcase and share those same practices that they're implementing on their own farms. Um, you know, we do, we do say we're a big tent, so we do have a variety of producers. We have um, folks who are organic, some folks who are conventional, and then folks who are in between. Um, whether that be on the livestock or even on the field crop side um, of production, but specifically your pig producers are all um, primarily raising pigs out on pasture and have a variety of um, structures, whether they're in hoop barns or in A-frames out on pasture, um, and even farrowing or farrow finish um, on pasture as well. Um, when it comes to animal welfare practices, you know, we don't specifically have work that centers around animal welfare but we do help uh, farmers showcase the practices that they're implementing on their own farms. And those do center around um, animal welfare where it comes to, you know, you know whether, what are the, some of the preventative measures that they take, whether it's not, you know, administering antibiotics, you know, what are other things that they're doing on their farms, what type of seeds are they feeding to help eliminate or prevent, you know, some, you know, intestinal or digestive diseases or illnesses like that, you know, how they rotate animals on their pasture, um, why they do certain practices the way they do. And we're able to do that through um, several of our events, whether that be our annual conference or field days. You know, this year we're doing a multitude of virtual field days. Um, so being live with folks um, on the farm. Um, but that's kind of the way that we're able to showcase those different welfare practices and then have farmers decide for themselves, you know, how they want to implement those changes on their own farms. Um, and then, you know, one thing that's really unique about PFI is that, you know, our farmers are always really curious and that's how they all kind of unite in that curiosity. Um, so farmers who are curious about some of the animal welfare practices that, you know, how can this work on my farm or is this profitable for my, you know, enterprise? How can I question or evaluate that? And we have what's called our cooperators program, which is basically a farmer led research program. So we've had several pork producers or pig producers um, you know, question some of these animal welfare practices, such as, you know, everybody's really excited about yeah, apple cider vinegar and like it's super jazzy, like I would implement that, but how does that really work? Is that really profitable for my farm? So we've had a, a couple of um, on-farm trials with different farmers who have um, conducted, you know, apple cider vinegar and they're administered it through their water for, you know, a set of weeks through a set of phases of pigs that they've had and were able to, you know, weigh them every week and evaluate their growth and 
also equate that to their profitability. How much did it cost? How much did it cost to implement versus not implementing it? And really see for themselves on their own farm if it really worked and then showcase that, do a field day to other farmers. Um, and we've had a couple of other field um, uh, farmer-led trials where we had one farmer who uh, was really curious about the omega fatty acid profiles of his pork. Um, and was really curious whether, you know, what's the difference between forage, like all forage fed, 100% grain fed, or like that middle way of forage and grain. And was able to see, you know, how the omega-3s and 6s fatty acids really um, fluctuated within the meat. So, you know, our firm is really curious about different practices and how those, you know, not only are profitable, but really can be implemented on their own farm. And then also showcase and shared with others. Um, when it comes to the next generation, you know, a lot of not only young producers, but you know, in terms of young and age, but also young and farming, um, really are curious and really aligned with you know the way of life and the practicability of what it means to raise animals in a sustainable and humane way. Um, and really, it comes down to quality of life and quality of the product. You know, a lot of our not only beginning farmers, but even our established farmers want to create or want to create and produce a quality product that not only nourishes themselves, their families, their communities, but also their customers. And one way they can do that is through, you know, a system that Nyman Ranch implements, you know, with um, not always like pastured raised, but, you know, humanely raised pork um, and really developing a quality level product that they can market themselves um, and to their families and feed their families and their communities. And that's something that's really, um, attractive and especially for you know beginning farmers who are wanting to start farming you know they're wanting to raise pigs in a holistic system what that's you know one holistic two you know the least capital um, investment to start off with and as a low cost model so it kind of is able to you know hit all of the points that's really attractive for somebody who's just starting out or I haven't raised pigs before what do I do um, and one thing that I'm, I've noticed because we have a lot of um, you know, member PFI members who are also Nyman Ranch farmers, um, who you know, similar to PFI and similar to Nyman Ranch, have created this community and network to really you know learn from one another. And if somebody's even just starting, like really teaching and engaging, and that's where mentorship really comes in. I was actually just talking to one of our uh, members in Central Iowa, who's also a Nyman Ranch farmer, and I was asking them about you know how they engage through our SIP program, which is our Savings Incentives Program which matches, you know, at least um, $28 to $2,500 of their savings, uh, but then also connects them with a mentor to kind of learn about business management and also production. Uh, but their farm mentor was actually a Nyman Ranch field agent. Um, and so, you know, these individuals in the family, not only, you know, newly recently moved to a farmstead, but then were also able to learn um, about the Nine and Ranch model direct from a field agent, but then also just as a farmer and as somebody who's also started, you know, with their own beginnings to their beginnings and really learn and create a network um, and really create a relationship and a bond to, you know, say, hey, um, for example, if these families I'm talking about, like they mentioned, you know, of course you can Google and you can YouTube all the questions and like, what can I do and all the fancy things. Um, but it's different when you get to talk to somebody about it and like really go through it and say, hey, like, I'm doing this, does this work? Uh, what do you think? And then, you know, talk for, you know, 10, 15 minutes or even an hour and check in with somebody. And I've seen that not only within, you know, the PFI community, but also within Nine and Ranch, which is essentially like very super important, you know, with anybody starting out, but, you know, also maintaining those relationships for the long run. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like they could probably benefit from talking to John <laughs> as well, a seasoned farmer who, um, thank you so much, Celise, and for giving us information about practical farmers. This is a really valuable resource in your community um, and for farmers, you know, nationwide as well. Um, and thank you for elaborating a little bit on your animal welfare practices. And um, I want to turn to John next because, John, um, you are the farmer on the panel and I really want to hear a little bit about uh, your farm and what hog production looks like there, but also um, a little bit about, you know, not only your animal welfare um, practices, but what your take is on the move uh, to farm animal welfare um, and, and where you sit. I know you, you are in such a unique position in your uh, generations long farming experience there. So I'd love to hear, and I'm sure people who are listening would love to hear a little bit more from your perspective as well. 
Well, well, thank you, Naomi. Um, I find it a real uh, honor to be able to ad address this group. And uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining in and understanding how important this issue is. And uh, I think I should be clear to start with that um, I have my opinions and um, seasons is probably one of the um, nicer terms, I guess you get at my age, but uh, uh, you know, we are um, uh, I, I, I guess we're to the point where you know we're willing to express our, our views, but I want to make sure I'm not speaking for all the 650 farmers that are in the in the Nyman family. And I'm certainly not speaking for the company. So just to be clear on that, but to, you know, to understand how we got to where we are today, you need to understand that our farm uh, for most of its 150 years here in Hardin County, Iowa has been, um, has revolved around dairying. It still does. Um, and throughout the most of the most of the history of Midwestern agriculture, the dairy cow and the pig have always kind of worked hand in glove. And it certainly was that way when I was growing up. We, um, you know, raised ra raised pigs. Uh, you know, I went to college on income. I'd, uh, you know, gain selling twenty dollar pigs. You know, and so it it was uh, just one of those things that was part of farming at that age. Um, in the present time, the uh, uh, family pigs are all gone. You know, you hear people talk about, you know, farmers suffering because they're, you know, pigs aren't getting sold or they're having to having to euthanize them. Those are not farmer pigs. You know, those are all being owned. Those are all corporate owned pigs, and that's one of the big mis misconceptions. But right now we have, um, uh, you know. Transition back into pigs uh, in the early 90s because, you know, we were coming out of the farm crisis and we needed income. And so we kind of scotch taped together, um, you know, duct taped and bailing wired our old, old equipment back together and, and started uh, raising a few pigs just to try and generate more cash flow. But, uh, you know, the easiest way for us to expand because, you know, we didn't, we needed income, we didn't need expenses was to go on to pasture. And um, at that point, uh, you know, lightweight um, electric fencing was available, which made it, you know, very easy to, uh, to, to be able to put animals on, on the land and uh, to be able to um, uh, get, give them plenty of room. And really, um, you know, I probably have to admit that, um, running into Nyman uh, was more accidental than, um, than anything, but I really have to give credit to practical farmers because it was a lot of their networking that really led me to them. So, uh, as well as to a number of other, uh, uh, other developments on our farm. But um, when we had an opportunity to join Nyman in 98, um, yeah, we took it because, first of all, they offered a better price than anybody. Second, I liked their uh, approach and their attitude. Um, and third, we didn't have to change much. Uh, and fourth, those kind of deals at that point kind of came and went pretty often, and you, you took advantage of them while they were there because you never knew how long they'd last. Little, little did we know, you know, with, with Nyman. So, but, um, you know, the first time that I met Bill Nyman, um, they come with a group to um, look at some of our pigs. And uh, the first thing he said to me was, I like your tails. Because at that point, you know, getting farmers to leave tails on was, was a struggle for him. I had just never believed it was anything that needed to be done. Uh, it was not the way I grew up. And so a lot of our husband breed practices really are not much different than what, you know, I grew up with. Uh, you know, doing when, 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 when I was, uh, uh, you know, of, of the, you know, the formative ages, but really the system we've developed is still pretty much what it was, you know, when we first sold those pigs was we have um, 
fresh clover pasture every year that we farrow on in spring and fall and in um, a houses or a huts that we build ourselves. They have a special design to them so that they uh, are designed for warmer weather than, cold, than, than hotter weather. Or they're they're designed to keep the 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 pigs warm and the you know because that's easier to do than it is to keep the sows cool. So we we basically farrow in the spring and the fall, and um, it's it's a system that's worked well. Um, the the pigs stay with the with their mothers for at least six weeks, and uh, we tend to finish in in, um, in, in a hoop or. Uh, if, if we don't have quite enough room sometimes in some bedding, bedded open front pens. Our sows um, are kept on pasture as much of the year as we can. Um, right now they're, you know, on hilltop pastures where they've got, um, you know, breeze and wallow and they're naturally, naturally uh, bred. So we don't ever have to, um, you know, try and confine them very much. And, um, uh, in the winter time, you know, we do have ho open front housing for them that's bedded deeply, but we always try to keep some some crop for them to uh, be able to to, to grow to uh, eat and knock down and work their way through. But um, the things that we do are probably a shorter list than the or the things we don't do is probably a longer list than what we do. You know, we use. Um, vaccinations and um, we do use warmers um, and of course we do have to castrate but those are all done um, uh, you know according to the Nyman protocols and the timing and everything and uh, for those of you who can see it why this is the um, the, the Nyman stone stone tablet this is what uh, you know what what we all abide by those are the those are the protocols that we all have to follow and we're inspected every year. And uh, those protocols, I think, can probably be found on the website if anybody's curious about them, individual ones. But the point is, you know, we do um, a variety of things differently because of the way we're structured. And I think sometimes the discussion about agriculture just never gets around to really dealing with structure. But, you know, I get asked all the time, well, why do you farm there? Well, that the question everybody asked is not, why do I farm this way? The question is always, why don't other people farm this way? And I always say that's a question I can't answer. I can only answer why I do and uh, go ask them, you know, but uh, I have had a chance then to think about why, well, why do I farm this way? And the reality is it's because I, that's what I believe. That's what I believe is right. You know, and, and I guess we had instilled in us from our parents that you do things that are right because they're right. Well, um, when I think about it more, I understand that it's right because it involves respect. You know, and I really have never claim to be any kind of a, uh, have any psych psychological understanding, but near as I can tell, respect is one of those chicken and egg things that you can't respect others if you don't respect yourself. And you can't really respect yourself if you don't respect others. And basically I cannot respect myself if I do not respect the animals that we raise, the land that we are blessed to take care of, all the people that are involved between where our, you know, involvement ends and where, where the consumer begins. And of course, most of all, the consumer, the customer, that person who hopefully is nourished a little bit by our products than what we raise. And I think really when it comes right down to it, respect is one of those things that's easier to tell in its absence than it is when it's present. And I think a lot of the times that we're looking at a uh, society where a lot of people 
feel they are not being respected. And it's one of those things that I'm sure is probably feeding a number of the reasons a lot of people of different shades are on, on the streets today. But, you know, can I uh, make a difference on that by respecting my animals? I don't really know. I don't know whether it makes it taste any different. But I do know that the question probably should be, does it make a difference that most of the food that's available to the consumer today comes from a system where there is pretty little respect? And I think that's the issue that probably when we come right down to animal welfare and how we treat our animals, we need to face the reality that if we take how we treat animals will translate to how we treat each other. And if we're not willing to, um, you know, treat ourselves and our, our workers with respect, um, you know, is, does our product have respect? So thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, for your wise words. Um, and it really helps us to kind of move into this next section. We have about a little bit more than 10 minutes to answer some questions. And I wanna be sure to get to many of them from the audience. Um, I really appreciate what you shared with us. And I know that there's some questions for you and I wanna come back to you and Celise particularly, but I wanna address a question that has been raised for Rachel in particular around the expectations for enforcement for Prop 12. You know, how do you see uh, it being enforced outside of California? What are What is the audit? process like? Um, and I'm going to ask each of you, just because we have a number of questions, to try to keep your answers to sort of a, a brief response, if you're able to. Thank you, Naomi. And thank you for that question. That's a really important question. And it's a very confusing topic. So for producers who are producing pork outside of California, selling it in California, what is that? Um, the auditing look like for that. And um, I'll say that the first thing that has happened, so is California reaching out to all the producers uh, individually outside of California? No, but what California is doing is the government, the um, California Department of Food and Agriculture is sending out letters uh, to purchasers. So they've started sending out letters to uh, retailers, letting them know that operate within the state of California and are purchasing pork, presumably some from um, or a lot, from out of state, letting them know what Prop 12 is um, and what their responsibilities in terms of compliance and by, by what date. Um, so California is kind of saying to the purchasers of those products that you need to know what is going on in your supply chain and you need to ensure that you are, that you are compliant um, by uh, January 1st, 2022 on that. Um, so that kind of harkens back to why I was um, really focused on this transparency piece earlier, that it is really important for producers outside of the state that want to continue supplying the fifth largest economy in the world to be transparent about whether they're compliant with Prop 12 or, or, and if they're on the journey, um, what their timeline is and how they're doing to progress against that. Um, because I do want to note also that there is, this is not a technical kind of auditing, piece, but I think is a real risk that is worth bringing up, is that from both the purchaser and the producer standpoint, if there is not compliance in, um, if there's not compliance with Prop 12, that introduces a huge risk uh, for, for companies, um, particularly from an investor standpoint as well. Um, that if a company is not meeting uh, what is required uh, by law, they're not being transparent, um, about whether they're meeting the requirements of, of Prop 12, whether they're a purchaser or a producer, um, that at best could signal to an investor that there is there could be supply chain disruption um, down the road for that company, and at worst um, could be that the company is held accountable um, to not being compliant with with the law. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I, as a follow-up question, and I, this is really for everybody on the panel, um, and maybe each of you could maybe weigh in or whomever feels like um, he or she wants to respond. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, uh, Maisie, with this one, but um, what percentage of today's pork producers do you believe will transition to the type of farm that John was just describing? Over what period of time are we talking about? Is it decades, years, generations? And 
Maisie, maybe you want to start with your response to that question. I think that we need to be really clear that there's still a huge chasm between what we're talking about in Prop 12 and what John is describing. The Nyman protocols go way beyond what Prop 12 asks for. Prop 12 is focused very specifically on gestation crates. You may have noted that John mentioned farrowing. Farrowing is when the pigs actually give birth and they are still crated even under Prop 12, farrowing crates are still allowed. They're not allowed in the Nyman system and, and so forth and so on. There's many more differences. So the first part of the question would be what percent of farmers will transition to meeting Prop 12? And I think right now that's going to be a niche piece of every business, except Nyman, who is already fully compliant. But I think for the larger producers, they're going to transition just enough of their production to meet California and Massachusetts requirements. Right now, a huge number of pigs are being sent, or pork, not the live pigs, being sent to China. And China certainly isn't implementing Prop 12, right, <laughs> to say the least. So we've got to first raise the floor completely for all to get everybody up to a requirement like Prop 12, and then do much, much more work to get to what John described. And that, I think, is, um, is, is beyond my imagination, even. Anybody else want to answer that question or add to what Maisie just mentioned about the time frame and what that's going to look like for people to be able to get to, to, to not only compliance with Prop 12, but also to the kinds of practices that John just described he's been undertaking for decades now? I just want to note one, one thing to add on to that is that it's so important to have John and people who are raising the animals in these conversa conversations and sharing their experience. Um, I think this is something that is oftentimes missing in these conversations about transitioning farming systems because there's the very kind of logistical side and you know, cost associated with having to transition to a different infrastructure. And then there is the other question around learning a new way of animal husbandry and interacting with the animals and managing the animals and um, getting over the fear of what could happen if we, if we move to um, totally away from crate usage in our farms. And I think that it's really critical that, and I think we can speed up the timelines and we continue to make sure that, that farmers like John, John and other Nyman farmers who do this and do this so well are, um, are central to these conversations and can help educate and inform and uh, help to expedite the timeline. You know, maybe I could just jump into another question to, to kind of dovetail with what you just raised around the cost. One of the questions was for both Celise and for John, which is what the biggest barriers they think are to in kind of adopting new higher animal welfare standards. And, you know, just to your point about it being cost, Rachel, um, Celise, you know, when you talk to farmers about adopting higher animal welfare standards, what's coming up for you in those conversations? That's a great question. Um, and I, myself as well as other staff, like we speak to a number of, you know, farmers um, at different phases of farming. And I would say from the top of my brain in terms of like the biggest barrier, I think it's just like um, the learning curve and the exposure to different practices and um, the learning curve in the sense of not only learning the specific practices, but then also learning what, what, what works for one's fun and then how one can implement those same practices. Um, and then, you know, depending upon the type of product or, you know, marketing system you have or, you know, who you're raising pigs under, whether it's under a brand like Nyman or if somebody's raising, you know, pigs for their own, you know, pork brand for their direct market for their customers say at like a farmer's market or other institutions that they're marketing towards you know I think it's learning from as many other farmers as, as you can and learning from you know brands like Nyman and other brands that are humanely raising animals you know what is essentially the missions and the values that you want to implement on your farm and then how can you do that and how it works um, because essentially you know if we 
take mentorship or learn from someone else or learn from this person, you know, that might work for that one person or that one person's farm or the type of pigs that they're raising. Um, but figuring out what works for you, how to implement it, and then, you know, moving forward. Um, and then continuing to connect with people as you're working through it to not necessarily like um, regulate or oversee, you know, what one's doing, but also continue implementing the practices that you want to see for the animals that you want to raise. I think that's kind of the biggest barrier is, is the learning curve and then um, really farmers figuring out what works for them and their farm and the animals that they want to raise. So I just want to kind of drill in here a little bit because there are a lot of questions coming in about cost. So, you know, what is, what is the cost impact of Prop 12 implementation for farmers? You know, what's the expected cost for consumers? What does it mean for communities who might not have the means to be able to purchase pork that might be at, you know, considered a premium? Um, you know, what's the price premium for this kind of Prop 12 pig? So, um, maybe Rachel or you know any of you who have a little bit of more of the detail of that and maybe Rachel you want to address that first. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'd, I'd love to address that and um, fortunately we have a lot of historical examples to draw on for this. Um, so very specific to the um, gestation crate question and being in compliance with Prop 12. Um, thankfully we're not the first country to have gone through this to be transitioning. Um, there are, in, in throughout Europe, there is a partial gestation crate ban. Uh, specific countries of the UK have a full gestation crate ban. So we have seen these transitions happen, and there is a lot of good um, research out there documenting um, what that cost increase is. Um, so it's not new, thankfully. Um, but also, I want to pick up on the point of what will be the cost increase to, to consumers, and are we making protein less accessible um, to those in... Um, large disposable incomes. And I want to note as well, this is also not the first transition that we have gone through in the U.S. to higher welfare products. So um, we have, while this has all been going on, we've also been working through a transition to move to cage-free eggs uh, in the U.S. And I'm sure as everyone is aware of, virtually every major food company, um, starting with Maisie and Bon Appetit, has made a commitment to going cage-free. Uh, I brought up McDonald's earlier. I'm going to bring them up again with this example. Um, that McDonald's uh, made a commitment to go 100% cage-free. We are working with them on the implementation of that. They have transitioned a good proportion of their supply chain to cage-free to meet their 2025 goal. I want to point out that the are they raising costs? Um, it to, is, is the cost increase getting funneled through to consumers? No, it is not. So businesses are figuring out a way to um, and doing responsibly, working with the farmers, with, working with the producers to figure out a way that this works so that the cost increase doesn't exclude a certain proportion of the population being able to, to have that food. And we have a lot of good examples of businesses figuring out how to do that, thankfully working with other stakeholders like us and others um, to also do that responsibly. Um, but I wanna note too that I had a recent conversation with a retailer um, uh, who does not, um, you know, not a Whole Foods type retailer. Um, and they said, you know, we really need to, to have these policies and signal that we're moving away from these types of cruel animal production systems. Because they said to me that having, we don't want any of our customers to have to have the option of cruelty. And I think that is really important that we are not talking about at this stage, getting every hog farmer up to the level of, of Nyman, which, you know, that would be wonderful, but we're talking about raising the floor, raising the baseline and removing that option of, of really um, cruel cage and crate confinement for everybody. Um, and doing it in a way that is uh, economically responsible to, to all involved. Um, you know, just to clarify too, and we're, we're almost close to wrapping up here, but John, it might be helpful for you to describe to the audience the difference between a hog farmer and a pork producer. Well, I, you know, the, the there's always question about what's the difference between a pig and a hog. And I guess really, uh, you know, my, my take is that when, uh, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, either of them, pig or hog, you're, you're talking about the animal. And I think the animal, you know, becomes central. The commodity organizations were the ones that pioneered things like pork producer, dairy producer, um, you know, 
basically beef producer, they're basically looking at the end product and their concern is the end product. And you have to remember that commodity associations and that drive a lot of that language all run on a tax that is volume based. So they all benefit when there's more production. So, uh, you know, their, their focus is all on things like efficiency because, you know, their concern is volume. And that is really uh, kind, of, kind of that slippery slope that we run into where people are, are all of a sudden looking at, uh, you know, output and not considering all the externalities and everything that goes into it. And I think that that's a very disingenuous um, you know, approach to how we should be producing our food, you know, to just look at the, uh, you know, the food on the plate and not think, have any connection to how it got there, you know, is, is really, uh, it ends up with kind of being hollow, ho hollow nutrition. Well, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and I wanted to use that as our last um, moment here to sort of first thank you all for being really incredibly knowledgeable and sharing your information with us all today. Um, I want to uh, mention again that this is the first in a series of events from Nyman Ranch for their hog farmer appreciation celebration. You can visit nymanranchhfad.com for more information. Um, thank you all for being here on behalf of Nyman Ranch. Um, we really appreciate it and I'll sign off by saying take care and be safe to you all. <laughs>